Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Megan Mako and I'm gonna be moderating this session. I am pleased that we have another uh, submission for the Dollar Street competition and we, Erin Freeman is the second award winner. So we're pleased to have her with us today. Erin Freeman is an associate professor of psychology at the University of Oklahoma, where she serves as a master teacher of undergraduate statistics. Each semester, she teaches introductory statistics to approximately 400 students, the majority of whom are psychology, pre-medicine, or nursing majors. She is also responsible for coordinating and supervising the graduate instructors who are assigned to teach an additional 100 to 200 students, and for developing a standardized curriculum for all sections of the course. I am pleased to have Erin Freeman here to talk to us about Hearst Dollar Street activity. Take it away, Erin. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Let me start my video. There we go. Hi. Thank you all for being here. And um, thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Um, as Megan said, I am going to present a activity, a lesson plan that I've come up with uh, that uses Dollar Street. I think it's really fun to um, follow Stacy and Jade. I really enjoyed their activity and it's really um, interesting to see how we can use the same data and think about it in very different ways for our students. Um, today, what I wanna do is just briefly talk about the statistics program at the University of Oklahoma. And then I'll give you a brief overview of the objectives of the activity, um, a brief introduction to Dollar Street, um, and then talk about the lesson plan along with some um, student examples, and then save a little time for, for questions and answers. So as Megan said, I am the um, coordinator, the undergraduate statistics coordinator at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I am in the psychology department, but we serve um, all of the pre-health majors, um, as well as psychology and a handful of other majors. Generally, we have about um, anywhere from 12 to 1500 students take our um, stats, our introductory stats class a semester, um, and we offer it both face to face and online. Um, in our current class, our focus is really on statistical literacy, because we don't have a lab component. We do some very basic calculations, but the students really um, Try, we try to emphasize conceptual understanding of the statistics and how they're relevant, how they're used, and then they will um, practice that in a secondary course in, in research methods. Um, so it is a, a three hour course with no lab, as I said. Um, this activity in full transparency, I have done with a pilot group with some of my um, undergraduate TAs and some students that were involved. Um, but then this semester, so I have some student responses, um, but when we transferred to online unexpectedly, um, I wasn't able to implement it in my class in the way this spring, in the way that I had originally intended. Um, but I do think that, and hopefully you'll see that this activity can be used both face-to-face -face and then um, online. And so the idea that I had for, for Dollar Street was to um, use the website, which we'll go over shortly, although Jade, for those of you that were on for Jade and Stacy's, they did a great introduction to Dollar Street. Um, and to really use it to help students begin to understand confidence intervals and how we can use confidence intervals to better understand potential population parameters. Um, and so with that, we generally talk about confidence intervals at week oh, probably 11 of our, well, 10 or 11 of our 16-week um, course. And so I do this activity later in the semester after the students have some basic understanding of some of, of the um, more introductory concepts. Um, I generally take, think this would take about 75 minutes to complete, though I think students could definitely do some of it at home and have saved the in-class portion for the discussion. Um, in terms of resources needed, really you could do the entire activity with just your calculator if you want to draw your uh, visual descriptions or um, calculate your tool, your statistics, um, but you can use basic statistical analysis programs as well. And um, coming into this activity, it's important that students have had the ability to uh, calculate some of those basic um, statistics, especially um, 
the mean, the proportion, the sample mean, sample proportion, and standard error of mean and proportions, and that you've begun to talk about the interaction between samples and populations and statistics and parameters, as well as that they have an ability to create um, simple graphs. Um, in terms of the gaze learning goals, we're familiar with them. I focused on uh, three and seven, really working on those numerical summaries and graphical displays, as well as statistical inference. And the objectives of this um, assignment was to help students get better at identifying categorical and measurement variables. I am shocked every semester. I don't know why it surprises me uh, at this point, but I always forget that sometimes even this, what to me seems pretty straightforward, uh, students can, can struggle with. Um, and so then um, my hope is to get them more familiar with that, to generate the numerical summaries and graphical displays that are appropriate for the variable that they chose, and then to produce and understand confidence intervals. So uh, before I get started, just to talk a little bit more about Dollar Street, especially if you were not on the previous talk, uh, Dollar Street is a great website that was developed by Gapminder, and it provides pictures um, and information data for different families from around the world. So this is the home screen of Dollar Street. And you can see at the top of the screen, uh, there is a literal street that ranges from the poorest to the richest families. And they uh, categorize families based on the country um, that they're from, as well as the income um, by month. And students can, um, well, anybody can go and manipulate the variables um, and see a whole bunch of different um, variables ranging from the type of pets people have, what their bedrooms look like, um, what their families look like, and from different places in the world. And so just as an example, um, if you click on families on the left-hand picture, um, you can see that there's a wide variety of variables. Um, and I, the students that I've shown have absolutely loved this. They find it fascinating to be able to go in and really get a personal look at different families, as well as a personal look at data that they're going to be using. And so I chose hands from Asia. And when I constrained the data in this way, I, you get a result that looks something like this. So this is an example um, that I'll be carrying through for the rest of the, the talk um, that a student used where they wanted to see what do hands in Asia look like. And so uh, my idea was how can students begin to use these pictures to um, understand uh, confidence intervals and have more of a, a conceptual understanding. Oh, I forgot to say this. You can click on any of the pictures and you can get a more in-depth understanding of who that family is, where that picture comes from, and see other pictures from, from that family. So um, it's a very unique and um, I think fascinating and exciting website full of, of different data. Okay, so for my assignment, what I did was I broke it down into three parts. Uh, the first part, takes approximately about 15 minutes. And this is just having students go through Dollar Street, familiarize themselves with it, and identify their variable of interest. Um, so I tried to put kind of what my instructor instructions are, as well as uh, some example from student um, responses. Um, so after students go on Dollar Street, I show them how to find different variables. And then I just sort of let them um, explore on their own. Um, after about five minutes, I ask them to um, identify a variable that they're interested in in studying. And while they're exploring, I try to use this opportunity. I'm constantly trying to find ways to um, remind them and to integrate all of our previous concepts. So we talk a lot about sampling processes and Dollar Street is uh, more of convenient sampling or volunteer response. And so we talk about the differences in terms of a sample that's from random sampling versus um, non-probabilistic sampling techniques. Um, once I ask the students to pick a variable, I have them identify whether it's categorical and measurement. And what I found is that uh, at first, students don't know how to engage their imagination. And so many of them um, think measurement and because it gives you the income, they'll pick income or for categorical, they'll say which country or which continent are you from. And so I um, 
provide them some examples. And this has been really fun to see the creativity that students can come up with and how they can look at this picture or the, the data that's been given to them and um, operationalize different variables for collection. So um, for example, on the left, you have categorical variables like is the comb or brush missing teeth are broken does the toilet have a flusher um, what type of pet do they have um, example uh, measurement variables how many people are in the family how many toys are in the picture some of my students were amazed at um, they were fascinated they had a very interesting discussion about toys and what kind of that meant and and how many toys people had in their rooms and so once we kind of had a discussion about the ways that you can look at pictures and uh, identify pull out more variables than just income or country students became much more creative in their responses um, and so during this conversation with students it's important um, i use this to to reinforce the idea of operationalization. And so when I ask them how exactly they're going to measure their variable, the example that I'm using is um, a student looked at the presence or absence of jewelry on the hands of individuals from Asia. And so we talked about, you know, could two people operationalize the same variable in different ways? Um, and the students talked about, for example, whether tattoos or nail art would be considered jewelry, um, or are you considering wristwatches jewelry? And so the importance of being specific in that. And we talk about how understanding how the researchers operationalize variables might um, influence the way that we um, interpret the results. Okay. Um, so then I have them choose a population. Uh, so for example, they might choose income for Cambodia. Um, but one thing that I noticed is that there is, well, I just forgot how many pictures there are total or how many families there are total. Um, there is a lot of data there, but if you look at some very specific countries, you might see very low data. So I encouraged uh, students to look at continents rather than countries in order to have a, a little bit of a larger sample size, but still definitely manageable. And so for the student example, they chose Asia, as I said, and uh, they said that they were going to use the households from um, Dollar Street as their sample and their variable would be whether or not there is jewelry present on the hands in the picture. Um, this, these questions in green come from the worksheet that I developed, which is also available, um, that students go through and I kind of um, work through with them as we discuss as a class. And so then is your variable categorical or measurement and how do you plan on operationalizing it? And so again, this student said that um, they were gonna count any rings, bracelets or wrist, wrist watches as jewelry, but not tattoos or painted nails. So then for part two, once we have our data, we're gonna compute our summary measures and generate um, the graphical display. And so um, have the, data, the students record the data, have them um, create an appropriate graphical display. And I've kept it very simple in terms of bar graphs or histograms, um, just because we're really focusing on confidence intervals here. Um, but it's a good reminder for students too of when we use bar graphs, when we use histograms. And similarly, um, we're gonna create a basic statistics and we're doing means or standard error of the means, of course, for measurement. Um, versus proportion for categorical. And so I find that um, we talk about categorical and measurement in week one. And so it's a nice reminder again and again um, later in the semester. Um, and another thing that I, I use this opportunity to is to talk about variability in statistics. So for example, the student found that the proportion of um, hands that had jewelry on it in Asia was 0.31. And so we talk about if I had another sample, would I also find, you know, do you think I'd find a proportion of 30 or 0.31 um, or do you think it would vary? And if we have variability in statistics, how then can we make inferences about population? So um, again, I try to use this opportunity to get students to uh, create those connections between different ideas that we've talked about all semester. So this is our student example again. They counted how many pictures um, had jewelry according to their definition, out of the total sample size. Um, and then they created a very basic um, visual display. Um, and then they, they calculated the appropriate summary statistics. And so once we have this, we're able to then go on to um, part three, which is the crux of the study, the confidence interval construction and interpretation. 
So I have students create a 95% confidence interval for their sample statistic. Um, in with my TAs that I talked with, my undergraduate TAs um, in my pilot study, we talked a little bit more about the multiplier for a 95% confidence interval as they had a little bit more understanding of where that comes from. So this is a good opportunity to talk about that. Um, but I do have students that aren't ready for that yet. So we just use two as our 95% multiplier and don't talk about like 1.96 or the, the thing to that degree. Um, and then I also have students change their level of confidence so that they can actually see what happens to their confidence interval so they can begin to see that relationship. Um, and then they write a statement about their interpretation and then share share the results with their class, which also allowed them to hear the creativity that their classmates had in terms of thinking about the data in very different ways and learning more about, about the data from, from Dollar Street. Um, one more thing, another instructor tip that I, I discovered is we talked a lot about sample size. And so it was really important conversation where we talked about the various sample sizes that students have um, so that students can begin with some of them did better than others, but they quickly were able to see that if you had a larger sample size, um, though there's other things that come into play, you would have a narrower confidence interval. Um, and then finally discuss this, um, the usefulness of confidence intervals um, with a class as well as their limitations. So how does the sampling process make a difference? Um, and you know, how does using a convenient sample maybe change versus a simple random sample in terms of our interpretations. Um, and so we also talked a little bit, I'm constantly trying to talk about literacy, just general public literacy and um, global knowledge and how we can use basic statistics to have better understandings. And so our, my students had a, a nice conversation about that. Um, again, this is a great opportunity for students. Um, I remind them in fact, this made me think of um, yesterday's talk by Nathan and others, um, where we talked about the bogs. He mentioned the bogs of overconfidence, I think in the bogs of disbelief and how we have to try to balance from our students. And what I find with my students sometimes is that if they have a confidence interval, even though we know it's 95%, they are more like 100%. And so we have to talk about really what does a 95% confidence interval really mean? And then sometimes the exact opposite happens. Once I give them a little bit of caution, I've had students say things like, well, then why do we even have statistics if we can't be certain about anything? It's useless. And so I try to use this as an opportunity to show the benefit, but also remind them that a 95% confidence interval represents that only 95% of the intervals, excuse me, would cover the true population parameter. So again, here's a student example. They uh, use their data to calculate the 95% um, confidence interval. And they said they're 95% confidence, confident that the true population proportion of people in Asia who wear jewelry is between 23.4% and 38.6%. Um, and then I have sort of a debriefing question before we discuss it as a class, where I have the students think about it and try to um, make come to their own conclusions, as well as an opportunity for them to express anything that they don't understand so that I can really um, see where they're misunderstanding something or where they're, they have strength in their understanding. And so for this student, um, they felt that it allowed them to use sample statistics to get a better idea of the population parameter, but they didn't understand why they were using two as a multiplier. So it provided me the opportunity to go back and um, correct that or, or help that understanding along. Um, I also came up with a couple alternative instructions or lesson extensions just for flexibility. And so instead of having the students um, choose one variable for the whole class, uh, I thought, or choose one variable each, I thought the instructors could choose one variable for the whole class. So maybe, um, well, you could do income here. And then each student would choose a unique sample on that income, but then they would be uh, creating a population uh, or a confidence interval for the population of the world as, as a whole. And so after each student, comes up with their own individual sample for that variable, creating a um, confidence interval, instructors could, could display those intervals 
on the board and look for overlap and again talk about the idea that um, in a perfect world or theoretically 95% um, of them would or should cover that that true population parameter. Um, but again, I, I really try to emphasize to students um, both the application and the limitations, but they get they get pretty excited because they're um, they become very attached to the variables that they choose and they're um, excited to um, apply them and to infer about the population. So I have to um, temper their excitement just a little bit while also making sure that they understand things. Uh, the second alternative instruction that I gave was um, that students could compare continents on their variable um, and practice looking at whether or not their intervals overlap. So for example, uh, this student went ahead and looked at jewelry on hands for um, four continents actually five because they combined Americas, but, um, and they created these confidence intervals and then they looked at the degree of overlap be, uh, between the confidence intervals and came up with an interpretation here. So for this student, they calculated it and then they said um, there's a lot of overlap between the intervals, so they can't always tell which country has a higher proportion, uh, but because Africa's confidence interval is completely below Asia's, they feel 95% certain that Asia has a higher proportion of people who wear jewelry on their hands than Africa. So again, it's just an opportunity to extend the lesson or uh, focus on slightly different um, topics depending on, on your, your own individual class. Um, I created just a very basic general grading rubric, which I've also included with the, the lesson plan. Um, and then just in conclusion, I have found, again, with, with the pilot group that I did this with, that students um, are really excited about Dollar Street. They find it fascinating. I've shown it to non-students, my colleagues and my friends. They find it fascinating um, because I think seeing those real uh, people and the pictures get students interested and excited and also the freedom to choose the the variables that they're interested in um, and and again i i really try to use this to focus more on the the relevance and conceptual understanding rather than only focusing on the calculation so trying to get the students to see the big pictures and how we actually might use these confidence intervals um, in a way that they can have fun with um, and so I think Dollar Street is fantastic, as is its developer Gapminder. If you don't use those, you should check them out. Gapminder has some great um, visual displays um, with data uh, as well that I use in class quite a bit. So that's my activity. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Erin. We have a couple of comments. Uh, one. That was a great activity, Erin. And another one, extension one, would be perfect for an online class. Oh, so yeah, some that great is a good comments. idea. Yeah. And uh, we also have a question. So I love the chance for students to practice data collection and to think about opera, operas. Operationalization, I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> um, did you run into any cases where students choose to record similar variables in different ways? For example, one chooses a categorical and one chooses a quantitative. Do they have to agree on how to measure it or can they each choose a different approach? I think that's completely, oops, completely flexible and up to the instructor. Um, I think that there could be a lot of um, interest if they define it differently. I also, because I often have students that will say things like, um, for example, now my brain's not working, but like political orientation has to be categorical. And so then we talk about, well, if you look at, if you're, you know, looking at a measure of some sort where you're rating it, you know, you might see it differently than are you Democrat or Republican. And so this would be a good opportunity to demonstrate that students could do that differently. Um, but I can also see the benefit of having them do it the same. I gave my students freedom, but again, because I, um, it didn't pan out in my very large classes like I thought, and so I had smaller classes, I, they chose completely different things. So I didn't run into that, but I could definitely see that being a, something, especially if students are friends or are kind of working on it together. Yeah, I could, I could see with a bigger class that might be a chance. I have found that when I post examples, the students really want to use those examples. Did you have that issue or? Yes and no. So again, um, at first, 
they were not coming up with anything except for very, very obvious, like the pet example, that was the most creative they got. Do they have a dog or do they have a cat? But other than that, it was income. Coming up with measurement variables was really hard for them. So um, at first, yes, I gave a couple examples and they were um, very close. They didn't vary very much from my examples, um, but because this was a small group and we were talking about it, I really encouraged their creativity. And once they got started, um, they came up with really cool things that I, I never thought of. So I think it's more of a um, encourage, if you have the time to encourage them and really allow them to be creative, I think they'll be free a little bit. But, but if I didn't give any examples, they were very stuck. They couldn't, they were having a difficult time seeing past just income and where is that person from? So I need a bit more encouragement to get that creativity unleashed, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, someone who's asked about where is a link to the full activity? Do you have that available or? So I need to send that to you. I have it all in PDF form and I have everything, the instructor version, as well as the student directions. And I will, um, can I send that to you right after this as well? Or can yeah, you, and we can, we can post it on cause web. So yes, Perfect. that'll be great. That'll um, be great. Yes. And then I'll upload these slides as well, but I have it all, um, in PDF form. So yes. Perfect. That'll be great. And people can get it, um, at any time. It's perfect. Uh, also, does it take a long time of the lecture for students to record over a hundred data points and then enter them into the statistical software? Yes. Um, well, yes and no. Um, because the data set as a whole is not that large, um, they weren't having that big of a trouble. A lot of my students did end up choosing categorical, so it was a matter of counting. Um, but the few that did do measurement data, it did take a while. Um, again, I was doing this with a smaller group, so there was more group interaction. Um, again, depending on where you're doing it in class, I could also see that you could introduce it at the end of one class, have students go home for homework, get their data, and then come to class the next day ready to go. So um, as with anything, it varied on the student and uh, their, their ability. So I think it's a really easy activity that you can break up or have half at home or all of it at home, but I just like that um, interaction as we discuss it. Okay, good. So Another one has said, uh, can I post this as long as I give you credit in our teacher D2L share file? Sure. Yeah, that'd be fine. Great. Great. And um, I was curious about the, I, I called it one of my notes, the reflect part uh, where you had them think about the process. Mm -hmm. Do you often do that? And have you gotten any really interesting insights about what the students are thinking in those reflections? Yes, um, I try to do that a lot. Sometimes students, sometimes very briefly, I mean, but just kind of have them think about it or talk about it or whether it's um, through top hat questions or uh, just a discussion question, like a in-person class discussion question. Some of them it is more formalized and some of it is informal. Um, and one thing that I'm sure many of us have learned, but again, it, it amazes me. There's many ways to think about the same thing. And I, I am often blown away with how students will think about the data and, and those opportunities for reflections allow me to see that. And sometimes it's awesome and really cool ways that I learn something new. And sometimes it allows me to see, oh, there, I need to correct this because they're really um, not thinking about it correctly. So I'm not always, um, perfect about everything we do reflecting, um, but I do try to pull that back because I, I learned that as an instructor. I gain a lot um, from those, those kinds of questions. Yeah, I have found that it is really fascinating to listen, to really listen to what students are saying to an answer because it can really inform uh, our conversations with them. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Erin. I'm so glad that you shared your activity with us, and congratulations. Thank you. And now we'll uh, move on to our next session. If you are interested.